and we're recording. What's your story with you, John? Not much, man. Just hanging out. You know, another another day in paradise here in Las Vegas, man. Not the worst place to be. Yeah, well, absolutely you, not. <laughs> looking out the window at the moment, you're better off than us. Um, <laughs> so, for people who may not know you, how about you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is John Morgan. I'm the lead staff reporter for MMA Junkie and uh, USA Day Sports, host of the, the MMA Roadshow as well, and uh, do a little broadcasting here and there for, for CFFC and uh, the Tough Enough, a couple other smaller organizations. So, uh, yeah, just kind of living the MMA life, man. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun fucking life, right? Like <laughs> It definitely is. Yeah, oh, it, it, it's good crack to see the fights, even like just the stories beforehand. Um, so how... how Okay, I suppose myself and Thomas are kind of new to MMA, uh, so we miss like a lot of stuff with Ariel. So you've been the, kind of like the main guy we've seen over the last year, year and a half. And uh, I, was, I was thinking after one of the days of watching it, uh, like the post fight or whatever, and I was like, how have we not asked this guy? You know, we've, we've had some UFC fighters on and former UFC fighters on. So, you know, naturally enough, we had to ask you how you do it. So <laughs> fair play getting this far. Um, there's no slowing you down. So how'd you get started in MMA journalism? Yeah, you know, it's funny, man. I mean, I, growing up, I played, you know, a bunch of different sports. You know, uh, soccer was actually one of my favorites. Uh, you know, baseball, basketball, all that good stuff. But I did realize fairly early on that I was probably not going to be a professional athlete. Uh, so, but I still wanted to be involved, man. I still, I love sports, man. I just really do. And so I, I wanted to be a, a sports writer, basically. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of an old guy. Back in the day, you, did, you weren't doing podcasts and videos and all that. You know, I just wanted to be a sports writer. And so I, I, I went to school for journalism and um, but along the way, uh, figured out that there's not a lot of money in journalism either. So I was doing restaurant business for, for quite some time. And uh, but then I got to a point where I realized I just didn't I wasn't fulfilled, man. That wasn't what I really wanted to do. Not that I hated the job, but it just it wasn't fulfilling me as a passion. And, and MMA was something I'd always liked, you know, I, I, from, the, from the very, very beginning. I mean, the first USC I ever went to was UFC 16, you know, way back in the day. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I'd been following along from the very, very early days of the sport back when it. It wasn't an industry, you know. What I mean, it was just kind of on 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 the the outskirts. It was the wild, wild west. It was a spectacle, man. But but I loved it, and so um, it got to a point where I just wanted to get back into 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 journalism, into writing, and um, there happened to be an opportunity to to do some freelance work um, for MMA Junkie, basically intern work, and uh, took that opportunity. And the 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 intern work uh, turned into part time work. The part time work turned into full time work, and uh, it was cool, man. I was kind of able to marry my my two passions of a, of a sport that I really really loved and uh, a job that I really really wanted to do. And then, of course, over the years, that job has turned into uh, like I said, way more than just being a writer. Now you, you can't do that anymore. You know, it's funny. I talk to young journalists coming up that want to do it. I'm like, man, the big thing is you just got to realize. You know, there's no such thing as a specialist anymore with budgets the way they are and then the industry the way it is, man. You got to make sure you know how to do every aspect of, you know, kind of multimedia production and that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, we can kind of relate to that doing, doing media studies at the moment. Uh, do you think journalism, like doing that course, helped you at all? Or was it just kind of one of those things you did? No, I, I think it does. I mean, I don't think you necessarily have to have a degree to succeed in, in the journalism space, but I do think it helps. You know, if you can go to some journalism school and just kind of learn the ethics, learn the basics, you know, get introduced to things. Not to mention, you know, these days, uh, you know, colleges are, are a great way to introduce you to all the technology and to teach you through all the stuff that you need. You know, I ended up having to teach myself Photoshop, teach myself Final Cut, you know, teach myself how to do all these things. Because when I was going to school, you know, that wasn't really a, a big a big thing. You know, now it's a huge focus. And so, um, you know, I think if you can do it, it helps. Um, but if you can't, don't don't think that you're not. It's not like uh, it's like being a doctor or something. But like, oh, I didn't really go to school to learn how to do surgery. I just kind of figured it out on my own. You know what I mean? That's, <laughs> that's not, that's not going to work so well. But journalism, you, you could you could figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely think college helped. Like we like first year college, we just basically learned how to use Photoshop and multiple different like video editing softwares, which I think really has really helped us in making the podcast and. Jared loves using Photoshop to make all our thumbnails look. Oh, the reason I, I, I promise you already, I'm going to make you look good in this one. <laughs> I appreciate it. I mean, so there you go. That's that's what I'm talking about. Just that technical stuff. I mean, that's a huge that's that's a huge assist. That that's the that's the basic. I say that that can be very beneficial for you. Mm. Mm. So that kind of leads into like you know clickbaity stuff. Do you ever find yourself having to ask these kind of buzz questions when you're when you're asking fighters? I guess questions. 
I, I don't like to, you know, to be honest with you, I don't, man. I try not to be that guy. You know what I mean? If I, I try to ask things that I actually care about, you know, and, and I get, I get a lot of, of people tell me, Hey, you know, Hey John, I, I appreciate it. You know, cause as a fan, you're asking things that I want to hear. And that means a lot to me, man. You know, I do still at the end of the day, I, I consider myself a fan of the sport. And so if I can ask things that I know fans want to hear, um, that's, that, that means something to me, but yeah, you know, listen, sometimes you got to ask tough questions. I mean, there's some things that, um, aren't fun to talk about, especially when you get into stuff like legal matters and lawsuits and things like that. It's not fun to talk about, but you have to do it because it's part of your job. It's responsibility. I mean, heck, uh, over in, over in Abu Dhabi, you know, earlier this year, you know, having to ask Conor McGregor about the allegations against him, you know, in the middle of a press conference. But I knew that was the only access that I was going to have to Conor McGregor that week. So that was the only opportunity that I would have to ask him about it. It's not fun to ask that stuff, but it would be, I would be, you know, not doing my, my job if I didn't, but you know, as far as like clickbait and, and that sort of stuff, man, I, I, I don't know, man. I, 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 I want to be able to sleep well at night. You know, I, mean, I want to feel like I'm doing a good job and I'm doing doing the right thing. I'm not out here just trying to get cheap page views. I, I my to me, my my morals, I guess, dictate that, that I act a different way than that. Well, I'm happy to hear. But I'll tell you now, like in fairness, you, you're doing a really good job. Thank uh, you. I appreciate so, that. Like, I, I, OK, well, like, obviously, we have to, I knew you beforehand, but like having to, you know, investigate more for, you know, having a chat with you. I, I haven't come across anything that I was like, hmm. <laughs> so you know, so, so far so good, buddy. I appreciate uh, that. I appreciate it. So speaking of McGregor, you got some uh, some opinions on him with uh, regards to the next title shot. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because I mean, uh, listen, I'll, I'll be honest. Right now, as I stand here, and things could change over the next you know month and a half or whatever. But I'm, I'm picking Dustin Poirier in the trilogy fight. Um, but that said, if Conor McGregor wins, I I, I don't see necessarily how you would deny him a title shot. And I don't think that he's necessarily the most deserving contender for it in terms of, you know, meritocracy and recent record, but he's the biggest star in the history of the sport. You know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of an interesting dilemma, right? Because on, on the one hand, I don't think, you know, I think there's a, a number of names in the lightweight division who, who are doing, uh, you know, better things right now. I mean, you look at a guy like Benil Dariush and the win streak that he's on and the, and the results that he's had of late, you know, he's got a case for, for being in there, but if you're the UFC and your job is to sell pay-per-views and you're trying to be as you know financially successful as possible and you go, well, listen, hmm, I can do Oliveira McGregor or I can do Oliveira Darius. Well, of course <laughs> you're going to put Conor McGregor in there. You know what I mean? you got to make as much money as you can. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the interesting thing. You, you just have to remember it about this sport. You know, it's, it's different than any other sport in, in the fact that, you know, you can't just – uh, pick and choose who you want in there. You know what I mean? I, hell, I guess, you know, it's kind of funny. You, you look at like what's happened in soccer recently, right? Where they were trying to do this kind of super league or what have oh, you, that yeah. these teams were like, you know, they're picking the biggest names and yeah. they were going to make their own league and the fans revolted against it. Right. That's kind of what we have here. You know, it's not always just about who's winning. You know what I mean? It's about picking the biggest names in the sport. So yeah, it's, it's a funny position to be in. I mean, I, I have all the respect in the world for Conor McGregor and what he's accomplished and, and what he's done for, hell himself and his future generations you know what i mean um but i don't think he's necessarily the number one contender in the lightweight division right now even if he does beat dustin poirier but he'll get the title shot if he wins there's no question in my mind i definitely agree with you there that yeah i'd say the winner of that fight is probably going to get the title shot next um yeah it's probably the biggest fight of the lightweight division coming up um yeah i'm really excited for it i mean we're, we're irish i mean Every time he fights, we tune in. We can't help it. Yeah. Like, remember, you know, we to... tune into every fight. We tune much. into everything. Well, listen, I mean, dude, the Conor McGregor show is, is a great one, man. I cannot wait to be in T Mobile Arena and, and have a full crowd again, man, because there is just something absolutely electric about when Conor McGregor fights, man. It's different. The atmosphere, the buzz, the feel, the building, uh, it's amazing. But, man, the, the, the guy's got to win. You know what I mean? It, 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 as big of a star as he is. And again, there's no denying, you know, I, he is unquestionably the biggest star in the history of the sport. Um, but in terms of, you know, his relevance in the division right now, man, I think this is an important fight for him, man. He loses his fight. I, I, I don't know where you go from there. You know what I mean? The, the, the star will still shine. You're still, you know, the casual fan uh, will probably have no idea, you know, what your record is. They will have no idea how long it's been since you've, you know, won a, a really meaningful fight in the rankings. He's still Conor McGregor. You know, he's still that star. But um, mm -hmm. I think for, for the hardcores, uh, he's got to win to stay relevant. Yeah. yeah, you're you're about as hardcore as it gets. So I, I love hearing your opinion on it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Is, is, is it your full time gig? The uh, the MMA journalism. Yeah, yes, yeah, full that time awesome. and, and uh, more, man. It's it's it's, uh, it's it's my life, man. <laughs> uh, so you, you just follow like wherever like MMA is in in the states, right? 
Yeah, I mean, around the world, you know, it's fortunate, man. I've, I've been able to travel the globe, and obviously with the pandemic over the last year, uh, I mean, I did do all the Fight Island shows, so still do some international travel. But, man, I mean, uh, there was a time when we were covering literally every single event. I mean, I went to uh, Brazil 29 times, you know. it's a, I've been over to, to China, to Russia, to, you know, everywhere in between. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've been fortunate to see the world uh, covering the sport. And, uh, you know, obviously this past year has been a little bit different. It's been you know, 15 minutes down the road in my backyard, which, which hasn't been the worst thing ever either. You know, I've, I've had a lot more time at home with my son and, and my wife. So uh, it hasn't been awful. Yeah, that's, that's good, man. You know, yeah, I'm happy to hear that anyway. But um, yeah, the, the UFC is constantly growing, but with the likes of McGregor thing, they, they have to go with the money. And, you know, they're, they're getting a lot of media at the moment, but unfortunately not, it's not from within or from the fans. It's with that uh, blonde haired lad, Jake Paul. <laughs> Um, what do you think about that whole situation do do you think he would ever get a chance at you know fighting mcgregor or ever fighting in the ufc listen i mean if connor doesn't beat dustin poirier maybe connor's interested in in boxing jake paul it would certainly generate huge numbers and i mean um you know i think i think it's a fight that that connor could could potentially win you know what i mean even though he's not necessarily the most seasoned boxer you know neither is jake paul so uh in in many ways they're kind of on level terms in, in in that sport um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't see Jake ever coming to the UFC or fighting a mixed martial arts contest. I mean, I think he's made it clear, you know, when he was kind of having the beef with, with Daniel Cormier, I think he kind of even came out and said, look, I'm not going to fight the guy in MMA. Like I understand <laughs> the guy would beat me yeah. in MMA, um, but I think <laughs> I can beat him in boxing. Uh, I'm not going to fight him cause I'm not used to that. Then he goes and yeah. gets arrested to fight him in boxing. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> unbelievable. But you know, listen, it, it's funny the, the Jake Paul situation. I'm not, not a huge fan of, of, of the guys, but Hell, I respect their hustle, man. They've been able to get – we were in Jacksonville, Florida, and the entire arena was was screaming out F Jake Paul, and he was yeah. just – he was loving it, man. He was eating it up. He's like – I mean, in many ways, I, I was kind of surprised that, you know, it just goes to show you how how invested fans are. You know what I mean? Like, the, if you really don't like the guy and don't care, the, the better thing, just be ignore the guy. You know what I mean? But instead, he's, he's gotten under your skin so much you feel the need to, to yell out F Jake Paul, man. It just goes to show you that they're – what they're doing is working. You know, I think that's his tactic, and he likes to play off like all the hate he receives, and he knows everybody tunes into his fights to see him lose, and I think that actually like encourages yeah. him more. And I think I think it was smart to, for the UFC to even let him go to the event because they knew it would draw in numbers. It would, uh, you know, people would click on the articles or watch the videos of Jake versus Daniel, or you know what I mean. Like it was smart on them to actually let him go to the event. <laughs> yeah, no yeah, doubt. I mean. You could have stepped in, but yeah, again, he's not he's not gonna step in. I mean, literally anybody on the roster would, would beat him in an MMA fight. Yeah. <laughs> who, who who was it like Oh that da- da- Daniel Cormier said before, like oh or someone asked him like well what's your, who's your pick to f- to fight Jake Paul? Francis and Ganu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that's uh, just like a death sentence. It'd be hilarious. Uh, or then Dana's White one what what did Dana White say? He said he said Amanda Nunes didn't he? He did. Yeah. He did. She would kick his ass, man. I don't think there's anyone who's going to beat her anytime soon. So I'm saying, literally, literally anybody on the, on the UFC roster, I would pick to beat him in an MMA fight. Anybody. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you've, you've got to talk to a lot of um, to a lot of uh, fighters over, over the years. What, what's that been like? Because I can imagine, especially being such like a big fan, like it might be intimidating at times. I mean, listen, there's certainly fighters that have like an aura about them. You know, I mean, the first time you meet like a Hoist Gracie or the first time you meet a Chuck Liddell or the first time you meet, um, you know, whoever it's. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely fighters that have an aura about them. Um, but, you know, you, you just you, you, you can't get starstruck. You're there to do a job and that sort of thing. And um, no, I enjoy it, man. But, you know, the great thing about MMA is just the athletes that are involved. The men and women that are involved are like some of the nicest, coolest, most humble people. You know, I, I think there's. Um, I think there's something about the sport itself, you know, where it's like, uh, you know, the glory is great, but when you lose, I mean, you're getting your ass kicked in front of thousands of people and, and it humbles you, you know what I mean? So the people even. in the sport yeah. are, are, are truly, you know, humble, good people. And, and the access they give us is amazing. You know, the, um, the, the gentleman that started uh, MMA Junkie is no longer uh, with the company, but his name's Dan Stupp. Uh, but he came from uh, Major League Baseball. He worked for the Cincinnati Reds in, in, in their PR department. And that was kind of his background before he got into mixed martial arts. And, you know, he was always talking about, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, spoiled athletes that are in Major League Baseball, you know, these multimillionaires that people fawn all over, you know, it's, uh, 
uh, you know, it's funny that Real Madrid came and did a, um, they did an exhibition game here in Las Vegas one time and I went and covered it, uh, for, for, uh, for USA today. And it was, it was hilarious. I mean, like it's in terms of like post post match access to the players, there was like a mix zone where the media could set up and they were, and the players were forced to walk through the mix zone, but they weren't, they didn't have to stop and none did, you know I mean? No, no, I even bothered to answer one question. They were contractually obligated to send uh, one coach to the post fight or post fight post match press conference. They sent like the lowest uh, level coach on the team. He answered one question and walked away and that was it. You know, you see, you think about that. Whereas in MMA, you know, we're, we're, we're interviewing every winner after every fight, you know, we're getting USC president Dana White sitting down and talking to us or Bellator president Scott Coker sitting down and talking to us or whatever the case may be. So the access that we have in the sport is unbelievable. And the athletes that we get a chance to talk to uh, provide amazing access and are really, really cool as well. So uh, yeah, it's, I think, I think it's a great sport to be involved in, in, in terms of that, man, the, the athletes that we get to deal with are, are, are amazing. Oh, they're, they're, they're best absolutely. In the world. And you can even see how much, uh, I don't want to say better, how much it's grown over its, like, I would say most prevalent opponent would be boxing, even in the last, like, maybe two or three years, especially with this whole heavyweight shenanigans with, you know, Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua for, you know, for all the boxing fans, that was like this huge, massive event. And then suddenly one day after it's crumbled the gun and it's so disappointing to see. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, you know, mixed martial arts, the UFC, you know, regardless of how you feel about the UFC, because a lot of the, there are people that don't like, you know, some of the UFC's business practices, and that's understandable. And these are all things that are developing and, 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 and you know, moving on as we grow as a sport. But um, it's hard to deny, you know, what they've brought to the sport, man. It, it's a well oiled machine. They've done a great job and they've done an amazing job of growing it, you know, around the globe, man. Like I said, it's, it's amazing, you know, the, the, the growth of the sport. Um, you know, across the entire planet, man. There's markets that are still developing and uh, that are just getting started. And I think it's going to, it's going to continue to grow. I mean, you know, Dana takes a lot of heat sometimes for saying this is going to be the biggest sport in the world. Like, I don't think it will be, you know what I mean? I don't think he necessarily grasps how big soccer is and how, you know, nations will shut down to watch the team play. Um, but I sure as hell don't, don't fault him for his vision. You know what I mean? Who wants somebody in charge of a, of, of an organization that's been like, well, we're about as big as we're going to be. And uh, we'll just be happy with what we got. Like, nah, man, we're going to keep growing. We're going to keep getting bigger. And I think you got to respect him for that. Yeah. He, he, he's a beast himself. Never mind the size of him. He, that guy's jacked. Number one. <laughs> yeah, like, he, he must have an easier time, like pushing people apart. Uh, when they have a each other on stage. But yeah, uh, the, the, the UFC is a beast, man. Like that, that, that ain't slowing down. That, that, that's a train just on, on, on full speed. Um, yeah, like there's nothing else that does like like multiple daily posts with regards to like what's coming up that does the documentaries that does almost weekly fights like there's, there's the there's the pre and and post fight conferences everything just it is there for us to see and it helps you kind of connect to these fighters because in boxing like i don't really know who a lot of people are except if i, if I follow their own social media but the UFC will tell you like someone's story. They'll do whatever. Even with like people who don't fight. Bruce Buffer, you know, you find found out with Fight Lord he fought Frank Trigg. Uh, we we had a chat with Bruce Buffer when he was on, and that was that was an interesting story. You you, you managed to land a spot in his podcast recently, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Buff's He's been a, a, a good friend of mine over the years, man. Obviously, we, you know, we spent a lot. We you know not not so much during the pandemic, but we spent a lot of time together, like in airports and hotel lobbies and. And, uh, you know, obviously see him on fight night and that sort of thing. So we've kind of become good friends over the years. And, uh, yeah, man, enjoyed being on his podcast the other day. It was funny. It was, he was having some tech issues, which is kind of hilarious to see him try to battle through that. Some of, some of it got edited out, which was pretty funny to see some of his uh, frustrations as he was working on getting connected and that sort of thing. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but no, he's a good dude. Buffer, Buffer's a, a great guy. He's, he's somebody, too, that and I was actually had dinner with him the other night uh, after, after Saturday's event. And I was talking to him about that, like, you know, when Joe Rogan finally calls it quits, you know, that's going to be big, you know, like he's such an institution in the sport. Um, but you know, he only does the big pay-per-views now and they've got a lot of, a lot of great broadcasters, um, that, that are going to fill that fill in. So, I mean, he'll be missed. Um, you know, when Dana hangs it up, finally, you know, he'll certainly be missed. He's the face. Of the but man, when buffer calls it quits, like that's going to be a, a big change, man. I mean, yeah. that's, he's such a huge, you know, part of the way the product works, you know, the, 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 the introduction, yeah, that's it. I mean, there, there, there isn't. I mean, you look at, like, who's number two? Like, Joe Martinez. Joe Martinez is a fine announcer, man. He does a great job. I, I like Joe a lot, man. He's a good dude, and he does a fantastic job. But Buffer's, like, one of a kind, man. You know what I mean? Like, you don't, yeah, you don't replace Joe. Buffer. 
Buffer's buffer, and there'll never be another buffer. That's it. You, you can't. You can't. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. The, even even the two of them together, like they're two of probably the biggest announcers in the entire world. And isn't it just crazy that they found out they were brothers one day? Like it, that is a wild. I, story, I, I love right? their story so much. It, it's incredible. Yeah, like like if that was a movie that was like fictional, you'd be like, "That's the stupidest plot line ever." Nobody's gonna believe <laughs> that. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah. but, it, but it's real life, man, and it's true. It's crazy. Yeah, but like you're right. There'll be, there'll be no one to replace them. Like th- th- there's no young Michael Buffer, no young Bruce Buffer. When they're gone, they're gone, and it's just something that. They'll struggle to replace for a lot for a long time. Yeah. And then yeah. like you were saying if, if Dana leaves, whew, there's no one who can sell MMA like like Dana Weiss. Yeah, I agree. You know, kind of like I was saying, I mean, there's a lot of people that, that have their criticisms of Dana White, and that's fair. You know, I mean, all all that's fine, but it, you, again, you you can't take away what he's meant to the sport and how much he's played a central role in in its growth and development and its success. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I do. I, the one thing is, I. I I think you'll have to drag him out kicking and screaming, man. I think he, <laughs> he loves it. You know, it's, I remember talking to him whenever, you know, the, 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 the UFC sold and, um, you know, kind of asking him about, you know, would he hang it up now? You know what I mean? Obviously, he got a very nice paycheck uh, when he sold his percentage to the company. He was like, nah, man, like, I, I love this stuff, man. He's like, there's nothing I'd, I'd rather do, you know, whereas, whereas the Fertitas are happy to go, you know, jump on a yacht somewhere and just cruise around the world. You know, Dana, Dana still wants to be right in the heart of it, man. I think he loves the action, man. He loves the, the pace. He loves, you know, staying that busy and, and being crazy and being the center of it. And, and uh, I, I, I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, he, he's a hard worker and they'll never replace him. But then the likes of, you know, like you were saying beforehand, Joe, I, I can live with Joe going, to be honest. Like, I, 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 I watch his podcast. I like him. I like him as a comedian. But because... He'd be kind of weaned off him, like he's he's been he's been that less and less and less. And I, I, I still think that Michael Bisping is one of the best commentators they have. I was about to say, you throw Bisping in there, and he'd do yeah. a phenomenal job. Yeah, yeah Bis, Bisping's phenomenal. We just saw Paul Felder, yes. you know, uh, make his retirement official. He's great as well. I mean, they have so many. It's like you said. I think if Joe Rogan was still doing forty shows a year, and then one day he just quit, I think there'd be a lot more, you know, like, oh my god, what happened with all this? The product's not the same, but. You know, as as Joe's done it, you know, like you said, kind of weaned off a little bit. You know what I mean? He just does the biggest shows, and so we're kind of getting used to it a little bit. So, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to minimize Joe Rogan. Like no, he's, he's been a he's huge amazing. part of this yeah. as well. But we've already been exposed to kind of life without him, so I think we're kind of used to it. Whereas if he'd have just cut cut us off cold turkey, people would have tripped out a lot more. And I think that's I think that's going to be the effect of, of of Bruce Buffer, unless you know maybe at the end, you know, at the end of his career. And I was talking to him the other day, and he said, you know, probably another ten years or so. Um, you know, maybe at the end of his career. Uh, maybe he's only doing the big the big fights too and so maybe we start getting used to it a little bit but right now man if he just cut it off i think people would, would he'd be sorely missed oh yeah yeah but then it's like go on i was gonna say just because he has this very minimal role in the whole thing but it's his participation and how he does it that people love him like he's a, he's a national treasure <laughs> you see it i mean you see the, the fighters interacting with him yeah, you see the fighters interacting with him, man. They get they get pumped up and they're fist bumping him and they're yelling back at him. You know, just the other night, Jack Hermanson was was <laughs> yelling back. I mean, it's just amazing. You know, he he sets the tone. And then you you know you think about in Brazil where they you know the crowd screams back like every word of his of his introductions and stuff. Man, he's just become such a part of the product. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He's... <laughs> okay, now now you're making me change my stance here. <laughs> but yeah, no, he, he's great, crack. Um, yeah. So, with the podcast MMA Junkies, you you've been at this for for a while, right? And like it, it it's constantly growing. You're about three hundred episodes in. What's the story with us? Where's it going? Yeah, on? yeah, the MMA Roadshow, man. It's it's kind of my own personal project. It's, it's actually outside of of MMA Junkies, so it's it's fully me, me and my my partner Ken Hathaway, who's uh who's, who's a videographer at MMA Junkie as well. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of episodes on my own when he's not traveling with me, but we do it together as much as we can and. Um, to be honest, man, I just I just like talking about MMA, and, and there really wasn't um, as much of a chance to just chat the sport as as I'd like to, and then, you know, and so I decided, oh yeah, hell, I'll just launch a podcast. You know what I mean? It's funny, it was the MMA Roadshow because, um, you know, that's hell, that's what we did. We traveled from from town to town every week, you know, going someplace different, covering MMA show. Now, the last year or so with the pandemic, it's just been the, the you know, the MMA show in Las Vegas, basically, or Fight Island, but. Um, but it was fun, you know, to, to kind of travel around the world and, and just be talking about what the scene is like there. And, you know, we kind of 
get local journalists maybe to give us some insight on what the scene was like in, in certain countries and, and, and developing. Um, like I said, that, that part of the show has been kind of taken away, but you know, it's just two dudes that, that sit together and drink a couple frosty beverages and, and, and talk about what's going on and, you know, maybe try to highlight some athletes on the card that, that, uh, that you might not be, in, you know, anticipating, you know, feature some, some pre-fight audio, some post-fight audio, that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, man, I, I, I love doing it. I, lo- I love hosting the podcast for sure. Yeah, it's it's good crack to listen to. I gave it a listen beforehand, just to kind of prepare myself. So uh, anyone who's listening, give it a watch. It's it's great crack. Uh, I appreciate it. Part. I, like I said, I, I appreciate that. Like I said, just sitting down, drinking a couple couple beverages, and uh, and talking MMA. So you know, I've, I've had people say, hey, I feel like it's like we're sitting at the bar, you know, just having a conversation. I'm like, cool. That's yeah. exactly what I want it to be like. You know what I mean? It's, it's literally that. It's it's like that's the same kind of conversation you'd have like when you're preparing for one of your favorite fighters to go on. So it's, it's good to listen to. Absolutely. But, uh, Thank you, brother. With regards to MMA Junkie, how, how'd you get involved in that? It's crazy, man. It's a cra- yeah, it's a crazy, crazy story, man. So, um, you know, I kind of mentioned how the fact that I'd gotten out of journalism was in the restaurant business. When I got to the fact, you know, that I wanted to get back into writing again, uh, MMA was my favorite sport. And so uh, I used to be a daily reader of, uh, of MMA Weekly, the website MMAweekly.com. And uh, in their in their message board, there was uh, basically in their forums, there was a post that somebody was looking for somebody. It was called Tag Radio at the time. It was Gordis George and Frank Trigg, um, and they were doing a radio show, um, you know, podcast, and they wanted somebody to help kind of write up recaps of their interviews to put on MMA Junkie. Um, at the time, I hadn't even heard of MMA Junkie. It was it was small. It had only been launched like less than a year, but they were developing this content partnership. And so I reached out and I was like, Hey, I'd like to fulfill that role for you. And um, you know, we talked a little bit and I said, all right, let's, let's do it. And so I started doing just recapping some of their interviews, writing up, you know, basically stories based on the interviews they had and, and, and using that as a content partnership between tag radio and MMA junkie. Um, and eventually, uh, MMA junkie bought tag radio. It became MMA junkie radio. Those guys are still doing it today. They're over, you know, my 300 episodes, they're over 3000 episodes. It's pretty, pretty insane. They've been doing it for 14 years, I think now, but, that's uh, crazy. But yeah, so it was, you know, so just, that's how we got into it. Um, and then uh, MMA Junkie started growing, and they were ready to hire somebody. I was the first employee they hired, um, and I've been with them, been with them ever since. I mean, I think that was 2000, like late 2006, early 2007, uh, and I've, I've been doing it ever since. Jeez, you're a loyal one. Wow. You've been at it for a while. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, man. You know, I've had some opportunities to leave over the years. I mean, I've always, you know, I've had conversations with other other websites and other media outlets, and you know, some of them have gotten kind of advanced, to be honest with you, and and and, and you know. But there's something kind of cool about being with the brand that long. You know what I mean? I, I take a lot of pride. I don't feel like I'm just, you know, somebody that's collecting a paycheck from a, from a, from a brand or a website or whatever. You know, I feel like I've really helped build MMA Junkie. And that's, there's something kind of cool about that, you know? So, uh, you know, obviously if somebody came in and said, hey, we'll, we'll double your salary tomorrow to come, come with us. I mean, yeah, you got to think about that. You know, I got a wife and kid <laughs> to support, you know? So it's like you got you to gotta weigh it out. Um, so it can't be blind loyalty, you know what I mean? It's it's got to be um, requisited well, but um, but it's cool, man. I, I I like I like being with the brand that long and, and kind of being associated with it. No, good to hear at least. <laughs> it's it's a good cool. one. But um, well, do, do you yourself have any MMA experience or yeah experience? Trained, yeah. Used to train. I mean, obviously, it's it's been a long time since so I trained. I mean, my 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 son just started training again. We took a year off during the pandemic just because it just kind of. You know, it felt weird going to gyms. Well, there's hell, they were shut down for a while. And then once they opened back up, I was kind of a little worried because I was like, well, if I get sick or if I, you know, if I test positive for COVID-19, if I, even if it doesn't affect me, like I can't work, you know, because we get tested um, all the time. I've been tested, I think, like 96 times, I believe, by the, by the USC at this point. So, um, so yeah, I, I haven't trained in a long time. My son is. I used to train, though. Yeah, when I was – it's funny, man. It, when I was uh, a teenager, I started training um, Guy Mesger's gym uh, back in Dallas, uh, Lion's Den. Dallas and you know cross like uh, Ken Shamrock and Pete Williams and Trey Tellegman and Mikey Burnett and, and, and all those guys so uh, trained a little bit but it was funny man I, I I never wanted to fight man I enjoyed sparring I enjoyed training I enjoyed learning the sport um, but I always thought man what if I fight like what if I break my arm like how the hell am I gonna like support myself I was a, a you know a server and a, a, you know working in restaurants at the time and it's just like and I, I think that's one reason I have so much respect I think for the athletes that do this is that you know, even when I was in my peak and I was in great shape and training and doing all those things, I never wanted to like go actually fight. Like sparring was enough for me. Training was enough for me. So when you think about what these people do, man, the type of mental strength and, and courage it takes to do that for a living, it's pretty damn special, man. It's, it's not, it's not normal. It's not normal. Yeah. I mean, we, we see some serious injuries. Oh yeah. Like 
Yeah, Chris Weidman. Ooh. Yeah. That that leg, oh Christ! It's it was. You yeah. you were there, like it was. Yeah. Was that was a rough one. Watching it. <laughs> that was a rough one. I was, you know, I was there for that one. I was there for for Anderson Silva's leg yeah. break as well. The Anderson leg break was really really tough because it was like, you know, he was like screaming out in pain, and that's. I mean, we think about what these what these men and women do, and I mean, they're they're constantly in some kind of pain. You know what I mean? So to be screaming out like you realize like how terrible that is. That was that was haunting. With with Chris, it was even weirder. Like it was to some degree because he didn't scream out in pain, but he was just completely motionless you know what i mean and at first you wonder is, is he in shock or is he just trying you know mental and oh man it was it was a tough image it was right in front of me on press row too and you could see the the bones sticking out and, and uh yeah. you know blah. it was it's tough man it's tough it's a, it's a stark reminder man it's a reminder like you know i i, I think you, you have those every now and then because it is a sport you know it is a great sport but you got to remember i mean it, it is a great sport but it's also hand-to-hand combat you know what i mean and when we say these people are are risking their health and their lives. I mean, that they're doing exactly that. So that's one thing I always tell people as well, you know, like, of course, it's fair to be critical of these people. Like, you know, it's, it's fair to criticize game plans. It's fair to criticize executions. It's fair to criticize lots of things. You know what I mean? But always remember at the end of the day, like even when you're, you know, throwing out those, those criticisms, remember what they're doing. You know what I mean? Remember what they're putting on the line. So, you know, carry that with you as well. Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. You gotta have respect for everyone that walks in the octagon. There you go. They're there warriors. You go. They're bad. Like, even, yeah. if, even if you don't like think they're good fighters, like they're, they're risking a lot. Because even with just knockouts, like, oh, there's it, been some serious ones. But what was that one with uh, Rose Namajunas? I, f- I forget her opponent's name, but Belly Zhang. Yeah, she she was fucked when she got back up. Mm-hmm. Or even I remember Jorge getting knocked out recently. He was one of the worst. The worst ones I ever had, uh, the, one of the ones that sticks out to me the most, it was it was um, Dong Young Kim and John Hathaway over in Macau. Uh, it was the, it was a tough finale, and, and Dong Young Kim uh, knocked out John Hathaway with a spinning back elbow, and the sound that it made, like the elbow connecting to the head, it was it was I, to be honest, it was me, and it was, it was funny. There was another guy named Matt Romanovich who was a former USC PR guy. He was on the opposite side of press row. We talked about it after, so we weren't even sitting next to each other. But the sound that it made and the way his body dropped, each of us, like, for, for a brief moment, thought he was dead. Like, it was, it was just horrific. Um, and and, and it, it's those moments you remember, you know what I'm saying? That, like, hey, this is a sport, again, like we said, but they really are risking everything when they go that out there. Like so, as good. you said, respect everybody that steps in there. And also remember, the, 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 the dude that you think is the worst guy on the roster, that you think is the worst fighter in the sport, would kick the living piss out of you if you ever got into a fight <laughs> yeah. with him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, that, that reminds me of, uh, remember Paul Felder went back and forth with that fan, and, it's, and he was like, Paul Felder, you should just retire. And Felder tweeted back, and I'm like, oh, you wouldn't say that to my face. <laughs> and the fan just goes, yes, of course I would never say that to your face, Paul. You kick the living <laughs> shit out of me. And Paul's like, fair. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty funny he's like you wouldn't say it to my face hey damn right i wouldn't say it to your face it's so true you know which is why, why it's hard to like be, be critical of fight of, of fighters or like what they did during a fight afterwards because what would you have done like in, in fairness like you, you everyone knows a guy like i would have just not be knocked out i would I w- yeah i would have dodged the, the spinning back kick like, yeah yeah the casual fan as we say um yeah we, we know it all too well yeah, but yeah, like the the injuries they sustain, man, it, rough. But uh, I I love the way the UFC handles it though. They have like, like, you have doctors on hand. They they, they have medical staff ready to go, and even if the fighter says they're fine, then is like straight back to the hospital with you, get sorted. Yeah. Which, I mean, t- thank God, because I mean, like, I, you, you ever hear people say like it's not violent enough? Oh God, no! Yeah, you just wait. Like, what? That's crazy. No, I do. I've been doing this so long, man. I remember, you know, I mean, it, it's cool that we don't really face this anymore much. But I mean, you know, I remember the, 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 the time when they were battling for legalization. You know what I mean? I remember the time when, you know, people thought it was, you know, it was ridiculous. And I think they didn't necessarily understand the sport. You know, they thought it was, you know, some kind of no rules battle to the death or whatever. You know, unfortunately, I think people understand it a lot more now. But it's it's really not that long ago to think back when, you know, uh, you know, I'd be on a plane or something and, you know, talk to someone, well, what do you do for a living? You know, and I, oh, I cover, you know, mixed martial arts, the UFC. And they're like, what? That cage fighting stuff? That's insane. That's da-da-da-da-da. And now it's, you know, 
it's a lot more accepted, which is which is good. But no, I've never heard somebody say it's not violent enough. That's that is bizarre. That person, whoever has told you that, is weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure George St. Pierre said that before. So that it needs to be more violent. Yeah, he said uh, if 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 he was in charge, it would be way way less rules. Wow. But then, then the person interviewing was like, like like what? Eye gouging? No. Like, <laughs> groin shots no okay what else is there really yeah i mean listen i guess you know there's people that say like uh you know knees to the head of a grounded opponent um which does change things a little bit you know you, you saw it uh in demetrius johnson's uh you know recent fight in one yeah, championship yeah, yeah. yeah. We, so you see like knees beforehand. yeah knees to the head of a grounded opponent is one that can be a you know soccer kicks to the head of a grounded opponent is one that like i stand to get knees to the head of a grounded opponent i would be okay with because it really does create some scrambles and some positions that are kind of stalemates now that, that would that would move a little bit i would be understanding the soccer kicks the head of a ground opponent just, it just doesn't it doesn't look great man you look at some of those old like pride knockouts it's it's amazing it's an incredible highlight but it doesn't look the most sporting and um you know i, I don't think that necessarily that would look fantastic to the uh, to the to the the family watching at home or what have you so um, yeah. I, I think the rule set's pretty good the way it is i mean there could always be some tweaks and that sort of thing but overall i think it's pretty good what did you think of the that controversial fight earlier this year, which was, of course, Pierre Ian versus Alderman Sterling, the only disputed champion? <laughs> yeah, it was it was a shame, oh. man. I saw Aljamain; uh, he was at the fights the other night. You know, he's living here in Vegas now, which is which yeah. is cool to see. Um, yeah, that was a tough one, man, because you know the the foul was. I mean, it was completely illegal. The shot that was thrown was completely illegal. And it's it's Aljamain is the one that's been forced to, to answer for, you know, people say he's faking, he's this, he's that. I mean, look, only Aljamain knows. I mean, you, you don't know what's, I mean, as, as he said, you know, let me line you up for a knee like that. And let's see how you react to it. Let's see if, you, if you're getting up and oh, I'm good. Let me, let me compete. It's a shame. I mean, that said, I mean, nobody wants to see a title change hands like that. So I completely understand why people would say, hey, he's not the real champ. I mean, he is. He's got a belt and he legally is the champion. That's the way the rules are written. Um, but he's going to have to go out and, and prove it. And I think yeah. he's aware of that and understands that. That's not, that's not unfair to say, that, hey, I don't think he's necessarily a deserving champion. I get that, man. Um, but, you know, this idea that he was faking or he was whatever, I mean, you can say what you want, but, you know, it's it, it, yeah. the knee was illegal. <laughs> the knee was illegal. <laughs> I don't know what you want to say. Yeah. If Peter Jan doesn't hit him like that, we don't have the controversy. <laughs> so it's a shame that it's so much of it has fallen on Aljamain. Didn't, uh, didn't Khabib come out to Dana and say, like, PR Jan's uh, corner told him to knee him in the head or something like that. It seemed like it was because, I mean, I remember I was in the apex. So I remember I could see his corner and I could I could hear him yelling because obviously there's no fans in there, so you can hear him. Now they're yelling in Russian. Um, as you said, Habib said he was telling the knee. I I fully believe that they they did tell him the knee, and this is the reason I can tell because he hesitated for a minute and he was lining it up and they yelled something. You could see Peter Jan even kind of like, huh? Are you sure? okay? And then he throws the knee, and I could actually see one of his cornermen go like, yeah. So, I mean, they clearly had told him to knee because they were like, yeah, you landed it. And then the cornerman was like, wait, what? Well, you could see the confusion set in. Like, they didn't realize that he was in an illegal position. So, yeah, I absolutely believe the corner told him to throw the knee and, and they screwed up. You should not have thrown the knee in that position. Absolutely not. Yeah. Dead right. I, th I think he would have won the fight, to be perfectly honest with I you. I do, too. The momentum was definitely shifting. The momentum was definitely shifting and he was taking control of that fight. So, it's a damn shame. Um, I'm just, you know, to, to, I'm looking forward to the rematch. Looking absolutely. forward to the rematch. <laughs> yeah, it's the only reason it's controversial. Like otherwise, you know, if, if Aljamain was kicking the guy's ass and then he got him in that, you'd be like, okay, that was just stupid. But uh, yeah, it, it's unfortunate. Uh, I, I haven't seen many um, rule breaks in the UFC. Uh, I've seen I've seen Eric Anders and I've seen the Aljamain one, but generally, yeah. like most fighters are kind of like on the ball. Yeah, it's it's you know those were just in both of those were just kind of unfortunate situations. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just it's a it's a moment. I mean, nobody wants to break the rules on purpose. Yeah. You know what I mean? Nobody, no, it, it's not like anybody's out there like, you know what, man? Well, I think what we'll do is we'll catch him with an illegal knee. And if we yeah. catch him with that illegal knee, that's it in the fight right there. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just, uh, just moments of judgment and, you know, brief mistakes, that sort of thing. It, it happens. Like. Yeah, that's it. I don't, I don't, I don't blame Peter Jan for it. And again, it did seem like his corner was calling for it anyway. So he's just, he's just following his corner's instructions. But, um, but so I don't think, you know, I, I think that's the other thing is like, I don't think Peter Jan's a dirty fighter or anything like that. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just that, just a, a damn shame that it played out the way it is. It was a mistake, and, uh, and we'll run it back and get it sorted out. There you go. Absolutely. But um, what, what, what do you what do you think about like the up and coming in the UFC at the moment? Because me and Thomas had this chat. We, we we do like this thing called fight talk every now and then. We discuss what's going on in MMA or boxing, and we're saying like 
a lot of the guys who are in there now who are like really famous for it they're getting a bit old and you haven't seen like the new younger crew come in yet like the Sean O'Malley and I can't think of much more um he like McGregor's getting on John Jones is getting on like Stipe's getting on um but I mean like who, who's who's next who's who's next McGregor well, I don't know if there is another Conor McGregor. I mean, listen, there will be continued stars to develop. I mean, Conor McGregor is kind of a, a once-in-a-generation type star, you know, crossover type athlete. But, you know, there will always be somebody. I mean, you trace it back. You know, it was Chuck Liddell. It was it was, it was was Brock Lesnar. It was Ronda Rousey. I mean, you're talking about, you know, the biggest stars in sport. You know, it, it, it will come around. And the talent is unbelievable. I mean, the, the talent that we're seeing come in, and it's from all over the world. You know, you talk about – you know, you, you look at the list of, of UFC champions right now, you know what I mean? And, and they, they hail from all over the place. And that's amazing. You look at the talent that's being developed in China right now. You look at, um, you know, the talent that's being that's coming in from from Georgia right now. There's you know, it's just kind of an emerging nation in terms of talent. Um, you, 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 you know, the, the Dagestanis continue to, to wow at their rest. I mean, and, and what you're seeing now is, is you're seeing these these generation of athletes who grew up wanting to do this and studying all the arts all the disciplines from the very beginning whereas you know the beginning of the sport it was like well i boxed my whole life and then i decided you know i saw this new thing and so i tried that out now you got you know like i said i mean i, I take my 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 son to, to jujitsu training now he's nine right now you got people that have been training in jujitsu since they were you know six years old and 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 striking and that's what they oh that's it man <laughs> so i'm telling you there's all kinds of talent developing so it's hard you know the, the thing about this is and it's kind of what we touched on earlier it's not just about wins and losses though it's not just about skill you got to have a little marketability as well whether that be because people want to tune in because they they cheer for you and they want to see you win or even if it's because they tune in because they want to see you get your ass kicked floyd mayweather sold a lot of pay-per-views to people who were hoping to see him get his ass kicked on on, on television so um but you got to have a little bit of that marketability as well it's not just about skills so that's why it's so hard sometimes to really to, to really peg you know who's got it you know it's, it's that x factor you either have it or you don't you know what i mean and then it's 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 kind of hard to develop that you can develop your fighting skills um but that x factor you know that it factor you either have it or you don't that's why it's you know another conor mcgregor who's the next conor mcgregor man i don't i don't know if there is he's 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 been a once in a generation type athlete yeah. that's for sure i really wish you're wrong i'm really praying you're wrong here but I <laughs> yeah know, i know you know more than me so you're probably right um yeah, I, I think Sean O'Malley is kind of like the guy to keep the eye on. He kind of has that Jake Paul thing about him where maybe you want to see him lose, but then he, he kind of has some redeeming qualities about him too. Um, but yeah, He's I, done well. He's done well early in his career, that's for sure. Mentally well. undefeated. It, <laughs> what, what do you think about that fight? You know, where, where Which he one? Rolled it, when he rolled his ankle. and Oh, that was wild. It, it, dude, he's, you know, he's fun. He came in the other day, you know, his last fight – he came in to the, uh, to the to the media day, and I was like, hey, I was like, it's the undefeated Sean O'Malley, and he started laughing right away. You know, I'm like, you know what pisses people off when you say that, right? And he's like, I do. He's like, I love it. You know? <laughs> and, it and it's funny, you know, I mean, like, he, he, he gets it too, you know. He's kind of kind of feeds the trolls a little bit as well, you know, by saying he didn't really lose it. And, and look, I get the mentality he's saying. He's like, look, I, you know, had my ankle not failed me, had my foot not failed me, you know, I, I, I would have won that fight. I appreciate that mentality. There's nothing wrong with that mentality, you know? Um, and then he, he realizes, you know, when he says it, it just kind of pisses people off. So then he, he likes saying it like, you know, I'm, I'm still undefeated. So uh, it riles people up and it makes people tune in and it makes people, you know, again, even if they're tuning in because they hate the guy, and they want to see him lose. So be it. You're still tuning in. He's still collecting the paycheck. You know, That's it's like it. I said, like oh, exactly. the Paul brothers, man, say what you will about them. They're laughing all the way to the bank, man. They're, they're, <laughs> they're making multi-million dollar paydays uh and and how can you hate on it for that yeah oh ab absolutely they're taking advantage of people's feelings but uh john i want to thank you so much for coming on you've been an absolutely tremendous guest it's been, it's been good fun it's just treat yes. guys it's, it's almost like your <laughs> podcast just treat lads just talk that's it it's awesome. there you go man you're just just sitting around talking to MMA. so if, if you enjoyed this and you want to hear more of it tune into the mma road show we do this every thursday night for 321 consecutive weeks i think it is we haven't we haven't missed a single week since we started wow and with your own social media if people want to check you out where can they find you uh at mma junkie john on twitter uh john morgan mma on uh, on instagram and if uh if you want to support the, the podcast like i said the mma road show wherever you wherever you can find it uh, including patreon.com patreon.com slash the may road show kind of growing a little community over there so uh yeah we appreciate it you Support. have it nailed i, I, lo I love what you're at keep at it um there's no slowing you down anyway um, i hope i hope you get that double up deal though where someone doubles your paycheck just to be sound but um <laughs> <laughs> we'll all pray for that moment anyway if you got this funny episode fair play to you 
Take it handy. Good luck. Bye-bye. Make sure you Thanks, check guys. out John. Good luck.